questions. This is Brian Foster. We're talking to you streaming live on Sunday night, October 6th, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, all time zones in between, and all time zones around the world. We're bringing this to you, another discussion about spiritism, brought to us by the great codifier of spiritism, Alan Kardec. And you can read his book from the 1850s, still fresh today, because it's just amazing to people. I just had an email the other day saying, I can't believe that spiritism isn't known throughout the United States, because when I read this book, it answered my questions. I had the same feeling. It was just marvelous. So I recommend everyone read his book. It has 1,019 questions that he asked multiple mediums throughout different geographical areas in Europe, and he did not codify them, codify them in his book until the answers were similar or the same. The other thing I'd like to have you tell your friends is to go out and tell your friends to go see the movie Alan Kardec. Actually, I think the movie is just called Kardec, and um, I, it was a great movie. Other people have seen it. They've come to the Kardec radio page, so, said how they loved seeing it. Uh, my my blog page, Spiritism in the Spirit World Around Us, said they love seeing the movie. So please, uh, it explains a lot about the life of Alan Kardec, what he went through, how he was pushed back by the church. So he wouldn't bring the doctrine of spiritism to people. We're told us about reincarnation. Uh, and karma and many other things and how we really are on earth to learn and to become a perfect spirit someday. So please go see the movie. It's, it is wonderful. It is revelatory. Now let's talk about, uh, let's talk about what we're talking about tonight. And that is career problems that could be caused by past lives. And that, Again, this is in my book, The Problem is the Solution, Seven Life Complications Sent to Test and Teach You. And we're already having people comment that said, yes, they saw uh, they saw Kardec, the, the movie Kardec on Netflix, and they loved it. So I recommend that to everyone. Please tell your friends. Okay, career problems. Now, when we look back at our lives, we often think that our careers were fashioned by a series of random events. In reality, we were manipulated into the professions we chose before we were born. What you do for a living is usually the fulcrum for most of your experiences. It dictates the income you shall receive, the people you socialize with, and often the people the person, I should say, you date, marry, and may ultimately divorce or retire with to a life filled with grandchildren. Our work is inherently central to our lives. From the moment we start to leave the comfort of childhood to the first stirrings of compensated labor, we make our initial contacts and find friends and mentors who help guide us forward. All this is according to an unseen divine plan. Our life adheres to a script similar to when our parents controlled when and where we went to school. The spirituality, through its army of spirit guides, lays out the path to the platform where we begin our trials, our adult trials, in life. As with the trials we experience that are of more personal nature, we also have trials to expunge the wrongs we committed in the commercial world. These range from a meteoric meteoric rise in an organization then falling hard to slaving away in a dismal occupation for years or worse the most challenging trial rising to the top while struggling to maintain humility and love for all around and believe me that it even says it in the spirits book that one of the hardest trials is to be rich and successful so <clears throat> when i talk about this what's expected of us now, I'm not saying retreat from the real world, for we all have our job to do, right? We need to act at work like we wish to act in our private life, with dignity and respect for all, no matter what our position is compared to others. It, it's almost like one should try to be more of an artisan than uh, a successful at any cost type uh, person. 
the spirit world really wants us to concentrate on doing whatever we're doing as well as possible because those are good habits for us to instill. And that is why it's important to do what we can and to be nice to everybody, right? In the book, Hell Christ, psychographed by Francisco C. Xavier, and inspired by the spirit of Emmanuel, which takes place in the years 200 to 250 AD, a Christian is talking about the need for equal treatment of all people. The listener asks, how can every person be equal? And the answer given is full of insights as how does the spirit realm desires us to operate and how the earth will eventually evolve. This is what the answer was. <clears throat> Excuse me. My son, I'm not referring to equality through violence. That would put the good and the bad, the just and the unjust on the same level. I'm alluding to the need for fraternity and civility. I see life as a huge machine whose living parts, us, should all function harmoniously. Some people are born for tasks that are very different from our own, just as there are those who see the common workers pathway differently than we see it. If we are aware of the fact that our spirit live on earth countless times, we change the course of our work from life to life, just as the primary school student of reading and writing ascends little by little to the highest degrees of education. Consequently, we cannot see how it would be possible to equalize the classes because it would be impractical. Personal effort and its consequent merit are natural boundaries between souls, here and in the hereafter. Hierarchy will always exist as the inevitable mainstay of order. Each tree produces according to its kind, and each one deserves more or less appreciation according to the quality of its production. We can perhaps achieve the necessary balance in our understanding by replacing the words masters and slave with overseers and workers. And what, what is he saying there? Well, he's saying that all souls are on the path to ascend, but not all are at the same level at any one point in time. We are all at different levels of spiritual and intellectual maturity, depending on our life's plan and where we in how many previous lives and how much we have succeeded or failed or kept the same in previous lives. That's why there will always be managers and workers. Therefore, those which have superior experience and knowledge have the duty to lead those who have not yet attained the required degree. Nevertheless, all should be treated with love and respect. Notice how the explanation given to us includes the thought that personal merit exists here and in the hereafter. This telegraphs what we already know about spiritual society, that it is led by a meritocracy. Spirits who are leaders are in those positions because, because they deserve to be. When we are in positions of power, we are expected to assist and attend those who are in need of our direction, the exact opposite of what many with authority do here on our physical plane. One of the lessons that the spirit world tried to impress upon the Catholic Church was their need to serve people and not be served. In fact, the spirit realm sent the high spirit, who was one of Jesus' disciples, to incarnate on earth as St. Francis of Assisi to teach the church how to care for the community. An example of how a powerful bureaucrat or executive should act is in a passage from the book Memoirs of a Suicide, where a recent suicide, Geronimo, demanded to see the head physician. Geronimo wished to travel back to Earth to see his family. Those around him knew he really wasn't ready for what he would find, but he was unconvinced by what he was told and was ready for battle. So Geronimo thought he would meet with the haughtiness of earthly bureaucrats, stagnated with the foolish boasting they enjoy so much to which they are accustomed, and was amazed to perceive in those scrutinating eyes the humility of a tear oscillating near the surface. The head physician, Teocrito, was an unexpected find for Geronimo. He was a humble and caring leader. Teocrito, he brought him into his office, and this is what he said. He goes, my friend, my brother, Geronimo, Teocrito, uh, Tia Cristo said, before answering your request, I must first clarify that I am not at all a prince, as you have supposed, nor do I carry such titles. I am simply a spirit that used to be a man, 
someone who has lived, suffered, struggled through many existences on the earth, learning along the way a few things related to the planet, a servant of Jesus of Nazareth. That is what I am happy to be, albeit very modest, lacking any merits and still deficient, a plain worker who, around those who suffer, is taking his first steps in the cultivation of the divine master's services of Mary of Nazareth, his august mother. Now, it would be very hard to hold any type of prolonged anger at such a bureaucrat, not to mention a bit difficult to maintain any higher moral authority. Therefore, after what I have read in the encounters with decision makers in the spirit world, they seem to be in their positions because they have earned them. What is more astounding is they generally desire to do the right thing. How many of us have worked in an organization with people like this. I know that on rare occasions where I've had the privilege to labor alongside a group of competent, caring, and involved people, where we have a manager that treats all of us fairly and we actually admire that person is a true blessing and one where all of us learn valuable lessons. Unfortunately, the situation never lasts long. Why? Well, I believe is because some power hungry, incompetent, but politically astute individual eventually maneuvers our bright shining leader into an unfair political fight and takes over. I have seen this happen occur too frequently. Now, now am I blameless? What have I done? Well, this is, this is the part what was actually the hardest for me to write and the hardest for me to talk about. I have committed most of what should not be done. So I have rose from the ranks from a programmer to system analyst, to development lead, to project manager over multiple dis disciplines, to director of R&D, vice president, and I've gone back down again. I have schemed, hope for the worst for my competitors and generally been the opposite of anything close to fraternal. Early on in my career, before I became a spiritist, I recognize the zero sum game. There are only so many top slots and to gain a position, others must be removed. Did I feel bad doing this? Well, yes, I did, which may be less effective, you know, against those other guys or and women who didn't feel bad at all. Because I have perceived other more rapacious rivals who never hesitated to put it in the knife and turn it just to make sure the carcass was dead. So let me, list the methods I utilize. For first, gossip. I reinforced negative attitudes. Very unfair of me. I withheld assistance when I could have helped to right the ship. I didn't because I believed I would have gained a better chance for advancement, for re remedying a failure. I used people to promote my own career. I knowingly forced staff to work overtime for long hours, past the time where they could work efficiently, just to show management how hard I could push a team. I created false alarms to highlight my capacity to fix problems. I suppressed real problems in the hope they would disappear, at least give me time to lay the blame on others. I bailed out of a company when, th when the going got tough. I laid off perfectly good people in the quest to make more profit. I pressured staff to quit so I wouldn't have to go through the paperwork and hassle of firing them. I'm not even detailing the routine requests that come down to management that must be implemented, such as laying off expensive employees to hire cheaper, cheaper ones or move whole departments offshore, causing great anguish to many displaced employees or what I hated one of the worst, being forced to grade on a curve and deliberately give a bad review to an employee because he or she is at the bottom of the list even though they may perform their assigned functions perfectly fine, not just as well as their coworkers. I've always believed this is usually, most of the time, something everyone can do. Now, I will say that some people should be uh, fired for not doing their work correctly or not wanting to do their work, work correctly. I've seen several instances of that when actually it was good for them to learn that lesson. But now, I understand the necessity to cut when the company is in trouble or times may be signaling rough waters ahead. But in today's modern corporation, the quest to increase profits, thereby making the CEO, executive management, and Wall Street profit, profiteers rich is more important than common decency. This is not an indictment of capitalism. 
since scenarios I have described exist in even worse form within governments, socialist economies, and remaining workers' paradise like Cuba and North Korea, where freedom is severely curtailed, or you're lucky just to lose your job instead of getting time in the gulag or the firing squad, or even worse right now today, well, maybe not worse, but Venezuela, where people are starving under the incompetency of government workers. I'm speaking for myself and each, of, each one of us individually. What I just said is, is my personal indictment, an individual rap sheet for all of us in this arena. At each step up the ladder, the necessity to attack rivals, protect your turf, abuse staff, and follow destructive orders, unfortunately becomes more pronounced. Whereupon, at some point, acting in a dishonorable manner becomes second nature and leaks out into your personal life. Mm -hmm. Now, all of which I wrought slowly built up a reservoir of brackish water within my soul. I grew fat, eating the salve of my conscience. I had high blood pressure and headaches as a result of the stress of acting contrary to what I knew to be right and moral. I did not like myself or others around me. My childhood dreams of being a person that people looked up to were dash. I, who wanted to be a hero, was in some cases actuality a villain, not a world-class culprit, but a minor irritant to the progress of the world. My example would never be held up to anyone as an example of good conduct. In the quest to be part of a better world, I had marched us backwards, not forward. Finally, as I, I'm sure I'm telling you my story, after accepting my failure, I decided to work at what I could, making enough to feed my family, trying to do no harm and to help the directives of whatever I company I work for to the best of my ability. I tried to stay down uh, in the low ranks of management to the level of individual contributor became my goal. I, I am poor. No one sees me as successful, but I'm happier. I am content with my surroundings. I'm loving my family, trying to be of assistance to those I work with are my current goals, although I am retired at this date. Not retired rich, retired very modestly. I strive to be humble, only occasionally successful at that task, and to not let myself be envious of the glitter beam from every screen and the parade of better goods and methods of transportation that I still sometimes desire. It is so important for us to recognize that I'm not speaking about society of a whole, I'm speaking about each one of us. And when we talk about capitalism and the movement of goods, there's nothing in the spirit world has said this many times, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. There's nothing inherently wrong with making a profit. There's nothing wrong with the efficient method of moving resources around versus the socialist or communist method where you have a lot of e even worse people with no attachment to any moral authority whatsoever. What I'm trying to say is each one of us need to be morally correct. And that someday when we are a planet of regeneration, it doesn't make a difference what we have because we'll have good people in charge. And if we, in, in our capitalist society, if that's the way it's going to be, you will have people that were trying to do good for other people. You may have companies that lose money and you may have to cut people back, but they will always try to be fair and good to their people. That's what we need to be. We need to all be cognizant of the fact that we report to a higher power and we need to be decent, honorable human beings. Now, that is how I went through my career. And I felt so much better when I stopped being in a position where I had to make it everyone else, as they say in, in the business world, drink the Kool-Aid that I had to drink, right? And I cannot tell you that um, enough how spiritism has made me a so much less stressful existence. I feel so much better and to me, that is such the key. I have time to read and study about spiritism to help other people. So, so I said this before, but I'll repeat it one more time. Whatever benefit or luxury you believe you are deriving from adhorrent behavior will not be worth the price you'll have to pay in the spirit world or in your next life. Please don't for even a second 
envy the corporate titans you see flying in corporate jets. The dictators with massive palaces, the rich, by nefarious means, parking their yachts in exotic locations. Instead, take pity, for they have no idea what is waiting. Mark well, we have either been we have either been there or will soon be tested to determine if we are able to retain our equilibrium when great treasure lies within our grasp. So how do we pay? Well, in our working hours, as in life, we are required to atone for our past wrongs. This doesn't necessarily mean suffering. It could be a constructive effort on behalf of others who require your help. There's a story of a man a successful judge, he had legal assistants all dedicated to him, and in return he felt responsible to them. The spirit world came to talk with the judge because they needed him to help free a person he wrongly convicted. And while the judge was asleep and was in spirit form, Gubbio, the team leader, the spirit team leader, explained to the judge that a person he convicted of a crime is actually innocent and the case should be reopened. The judge had already taken in the defendant's daughter trying to help her, knowing that he should do more to help the poor souls that he daily comes across in his chamber. The judge agrees to help. Gubbio, the spirit team leader, then proceeds to let him know exactly why he should assist George, the innocent man, and his daughter. And this is what he told him. He said, during the last century, this is the spirit leader talking to the judge, during the last century, you owned a large amount of land and you prided yourself for your position as master of dozens of slaves. Most of them have reincarnated and make up your group of legal assistants. You owe assistance and care, help and understanding to all of them. However, not all your former slaves fell into the same group with regards to your spirit. Some have stood out in your life drama and are back on your path to make a special impact on you. George, for instance, was one of your slaves although he was born under the same roof that marked your first cries at birth. He may have been your slave according to earthly codes, but in fact, he was your brother according to divine laws, in spite of been having born of a different mother. You never forgave him for such closeness, considered in your home as an insult to the family name. You both became fathers, and your son of then and now sexually abused his daughter of then and now, and faced with such bitterness, with utmost scorn for a slave's sad home, you took condemnable measures that culminated in an unspeakable despair for the George of back then, who, Amos and half crazy, not only took the life of your son who had invaded his home, but also his own life commi by committing suicide under dramatic circumstances. However, neither death nor suffering can erase the afflictions of responsibility which can only be renewed opportunity for reconciliation can remedy. Now here you are once again in the presence of George, whom you have hated needlessly and the young woman who have you promised to look after as your daughter work. My friend, take advantage of the years left to you because the judge's son and your ward will be attracted to the blessings of marriage work while you still can all the good that, you do will work on your own behalf, for there's no other pathway to God other than constructive understanding, active goodness, and redemptive forgiveness. George, humiliated and disillusioned, has erased his deplorable wrong by having to endure unspeakable moral suffering during a few years of undeserved condemnation and torturous imprisonment with widowhood, infirmities, and priva privations of all sorts. So... That is what he told the judge. One never knows who we interact with when we work. One never knows who we should help. And of course, we'd always help whoever we can. But think of the, the planning and analysis of bringing all these souls together and having to be the judge's assistants, bringing the innocent person who was in jail. I mean, this is, again, one of the amazing things about the spirit world is they bring all these people together at the right time and in the perfect manner to reconnect the various threads of lives. Then to tie them into prerequisite trials on earth for each individual demonstrates the wisdom and power of the spirit world. On the other hand, instead of the obligation to assist, we could have an adversary who we may interpret as a great obstacle. You know, the person who always takes the opposite point of view, whatever you're lobbying for, defending, or have just created. Their criticism is always ready, 
What is worse, their comments make sense and are difficult to refute. These types, while driving you mad, are actually present, I know you hate to hear this, to help you improve. While it's easy to react emotionally to such characters, since if they have constructive criticism, why can't they speak to you in private? I've been through that. Nevertheless, the pain of your shortcomings, publicly exposed, of course, is actually meant as a service. Imagine if you wanted to play tennis, was to become an accomplished player. Now think how well you would do if you were forced to play only with beginners. Improving your game would be next to impossible. The challenge would wear off quickly and you would settle into mediocrity, which, while delivering victory after victory against subpar players, would prevent you from ever being ready to take on serious competition. The spirit world knows us. They fully understand that we, just like children, love to have easy victories, successes without hard work and sweat. Hence, trainers appear at different times and stages of our career. Adversaries rise up who are meant to challenge us and force us to learn to perform at the next level. I have been confronted with such teachers. Early in my career, I, re I reacted emotionally, determined to fight back, and put them down a peg or two. Belatedly, uh, finally, I realized my error and strove to carefully comprehend their concerns. I found out that shining the light on defects wasn't directed personally at me, but at what I was trying to achieve or build. By using productive comments, I learned to analyze my projects at a deeper level, thusly improving my performance. Taking the squeaky wheel and turning it to my advantage was the lesson that I needed to acquire. If we are destined to become a pure spirit someday, then we must learn to strive for perfection. That's what I was talking about, trying to be at work, trying to be in, actually at home, at whatever you do, more like an artisan where you want whatever you are creating. And that could just be your family, your career, right? It doesn't have to be an object per, per se is to make that as perfect as possible, to make something beautiful out of it. We must dig deeper to uncover fault lines and potential pitfalls in whatever we do. We need to learn to take comments and constructive criticism as important steps in building a lasting edifice. Now, another thing that can happen to your work is betrayal. Nothing is more disheartening than being deceived by a person who actively plans your demise who plots to replace you with themselves or one of their lieutenants. In this case, it is most probably an example of what you have done in the past. That has happened to me. Thankfully, you've been allowed to see firsthand the result of such destructive behavior, how it benefited no one but the person scheming. And of course, it won't benefit them in the long run. You know, you do not have to ever worry about taking your own revenge. Right? It's not going to work. And revenge is a punishment. The spirit world doesn't punish. They educate. In some future life or even later on in their own career, it will happen to them and they will learn the effects of it. Plus, sometimes when they do that to you, their victory doesn't last long. Their incompetence and double dealing reveals itself for the world to see. Other times, it is the beginning of a successful career, at least from the outside world, built on the carcasses of co-workers. I have seen both. I no longer waste my effort in hating those who are dazzled by potential riches, those who will stop at nothing to satisfy their ambition. I have been there too in my present and past lives. It's a lesson that is hard to absorb. The allure of power, money, and the benefits it can buy is irresistible at times. And I've seen that. I've seen that during, it was one example during the internet boom, uh, this is one of the early ones before the year 2000 where people were just being paid thousands and hundreds of thousands and making millions of dollars in companies that should never have gone public a lot like now and they would sell their own mother to make that extra five cents per share it was sad to see it it was really that period of my life is, is really when i just all fell apart for me and i decided no i don't want this anymore i cannot be uh like this so you don't have to worry about people like that. It will be, it will be, everything will be reconciled by the designs of the spirit world. Because one of God's main laws is for every action, there is reaction.
Let's talk about another example of, a, of payback, right? Is a case of a Roman general. His, his name in the next incar, uh, incarnation was Felix. He had performed great feats for the Roman emperor Hadrian. He conquered territory and enslaved the defeated to feed the coffers of his emperor. To pay for his deeds, he reincarnated as a slave in the 19th century. During his tenure as a slave, he had a daughter. When his daughter was still what many would consider a child, she caught the eye of a master. The slave owner raped her, and the, and the slave owner's name was Amadou Ferrari. Unfortunately, this little girl hid the shame the only way she knew. She committed suicide. Now, the ex-Roman general, now a slave, couldn't withhold his condemnation of Amadou's criminal act. He publicly condemned Amadou, who in retaliation had Felix's tongue burned out with a red-hot iron. Now, Felix, who wrote the who rose to great heights as a Roman, was cast into the lowest level possible. He was forced to see his family violated, and he underwent torture. All acts that he had instigated against others when he was in power. The story doesn't end there. When the slave owner, owner Amadou, finally died, this cr the crew master was lost in the lower zones. He was harassed by many of his former slaves, who he... He had brutally used until their deaths. Felix, also in the, in the spirit world, finally realizing what he had, what he was, what he had gone through, he came to Amadou, the one, the, the slave master took out his, burn out his tongue. He led him to a higher plane where he could begin to learn how to behave. Felix's experiences from living and dying in the same manner as those he had early, earlier persecuted taught him the value of love and fraternity. Felix's horrible life became a watershed for his transformation. In fact, an act of true charity, Felix volunteered to be Amadou's father in the next life. Now, one of the persons just said in, in the comment section is he was asked if he would like to become a uh, coordinator. But I said I didn't. I, but I said I didn't because I think they're at least there being the boss, I could act like a truly spiritist. I'd rather have friends instead of more money. <laughs> right, so it's, everyone should see what they think is how they can do it. Some people, I mean, I'm not saying not to be the boss because then you can always rise it up and you can, you can actually make it better, right, if you can, but just know it may not work out our culture is a tough one, right? It, it's no one goes to work, but even when I was, uh, you know, just more of an individual contributor, even at that level, every, there's gray back and forth, right? There's things you don't want to do. You have to do it's in it, it, the spirit world knows that so you have to, you have to make a living for your family. You have to make sure, you know, so you can't just quit everything, but, that's just for us to learn and, and use for our next and our next life. So with that example of Felix, even volunteering to be this, you know, I would do his father. What we've witnessed then from a lot of people is we witnessed this honorable behavior, senseless vindictiveness towards others. And know well that this misguided conduct will be rectified. It was rectified for Felix. You may not detect the effectiveness of the treatment for many lifetimes or thousands of years, but in the end, it will occur. The person who have wronged you will eventually fully understand the consequences of their actions and will push forward their own conversion toward the light. God is supremely just and loving. The spirituality plogs along and plans out the countermeasures to every misguided deed we execute while to us on earth in our short lives, the lesson seems harsh. It is meant as a sign that all of us are treasured souls who will be guided upwards by learning the ramifications of not following the golden rule. Allowing people to continue hurting and taking unfair advantage of others in life after life would not be an act of love, but of abandonment. It would mean that individuals would never improve, that life on earth would be a chaotic place where danger is always intimate forever. This is why we're here. This is why into our senses, good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. But this all is taken up in previous lives and plans and intersections, 
all for our own edification. Remember, you know, it's, it's the earth is getting better. Many people will write to me and say, no, it's just as bad as it ever was. Well, actually not. There's actually been studies of, they've gone through uh, old cemeteries and found out, you know, a certain percentage of people were probably killed you know, because they can see the wounds on the bones, right? That doesn't happen as much. It, it, it's slowly, and of course, in our little human, you know, or a month or a week is a very long time to many of us. We have to look at thousands of years, right? Eventually, this planet, as we all rise up in our spiritual maturity, will be a wonderful place to be. We will be, Earth will truly be a paradise when we become a planet of regeneration. Now, so everything I've said, what's, what should we do, right? Well, look, we all know what we should do. Our conscience guides us and alerts us when we don't act in accordance with divine law. Our problem, and mine in particularly, is that we rationalize or you know, ignoring the dictates applied to us, at least for our larger transgression. We always think, oh, now I, I can do that and make that up later. Oh, that's not going to hurt that person. They've got plenty of money or, oh, they'll find another job or, those that's all rationalization of things you shouldn't do right we know full well the moral criminality of taking advantage of others acting dishonestly misdirecting blame or praise producing shoddy and dangerous goods the list is endless the testimonials of workers drudging away in morally challenging jobs lamenting their actions while sad is uplifting and that so many recognize the situation is at odds with what their conscience tells them, but they're locked into it by their need to support themselves and their families. And sometimes this is a learning experience where they are locked into it, and the spirit world knows that. They say, well, no, you're going to be there until you know that you don't like doing this, right? And you don't want to do this in your next life, or maybe even when you get your next career, you know, five years from now. Circumstances beyond our control often force our denial of what is right and wrong. The spirit world understands that in times like these, you have to carry on while fervently searching for a way out. There are times sent to teach us to recognize the patterns in which we arrived in such a deadful, dreadful situation and how not to allow this to occur again. Hence, I fervently believe that we are well equipped to fully understand what to do and what not to do in the majority of situations but I'm aware that certain destructive behaviors can become a habit, a habit where we have forgotten to check our conscience to determine the validity of our actions. One trait is our lack of assisting our coworkers. Unfortunately, many organizations set up incentives to promote this abhorrent practice. In the guise of demanding the best and weeding out the less than average worker, we are led to selfishly Selfishly, not selflessly, selfishly illustrate our achievements and to denigrate others. Ever mindful of the year in evaluation, we consciously let our colleagues slip or instead we should help them stand and be successful. So in many cases, it's not enough to do no harm. We must also help them carry their load and aid them to learn their function for the best of our ability to help them. Practicing fraternity in a competitive work situation is a dramatic gesture of your moral worth. Believe me, it's hard because you're weighing the raise pool, right? And of course, the culture of our companies now is like, no, we only want to give a raise to the top, you know, X percent, and the other people now they get nothing, or it's a, they slide it out. It's it's they they definitely try to set up people against people. Very unfortunate. Not all companies, smaller companies don't usually do this. It's the big companies that all you know, adhere to whatever is the cultural fad at the time. So if you do help other people in this environment, the spirit world will evaluate your altruism in your favor. And more importantly, you'll look back at your life secure in the knowledge that you did the best you could and rose above the petty divisions encouraged by lesser beings. There will certainly be circumstances where a person should be fired, right? I have disciplined and even fired people where I felt I was actually doing them a favor. Some workers won't take direction and refuse to learn realities of hard work, either by a reduced output or performance, absences, attitudes that make coworkers uncomfortable or various factors. Some people won't take advice and need to push out the door. So I'm not saying to be a pushover, right? 
I'm saying that sometimes you have to focus yourself being indignant on some of these people. And sometimes they need to be, you know, maybe written up or disciplined or even out, right? So I'm not saying you can't use your common sense. So, and those individuals that cross your path as, as part in when they weren't doing a good job is one of the, of their trials and you served unknowingly probably as their instructor. Now, another bad habit is gossip and i realize this is one of the great pleasures of work and the cutting down of co-workers or management which is my favorite of course is not how the golden rule works we forget that we wouldn't like people to sit around and point out our faults of course we have none right hence we shouldn't do this to others my confession is that i still occasionally slip multiple times a day at certain periods therefore i realize this is a very difficult habit to break but i have gotten much better if you just cut yourself off when you when you start thinking of this then it makes it much easier and i try and follow the advice of socrates who lived in ancient greece from 469 to 399 bc and socrates was widely lauded for his wisdom and he espoused many of the same beliefs that jesus would present to the world 400 years later as relatively young spirits we need to control our thoughts and not speak ill of others. In fact, we should seek out times to speak well of others. Socrates gives a great lesson on gossip. And remember, this is 2,400 years ago. So one day, the great philosopher came up upon an acquaintance who ran up to him excitedly and said, Socrates, do you know what I just heard about one of your students? And Socrates said, wait a moment. Before you tell me, I want, I'd like you to pass a little test. It's called the test of three. Test of three, that's correct, Socrates said. Before you talk to me about my student, let's take a moment to test what you're going to say. The first test is truth. Have you made absolutely sure that what you're about to tell me is true? Well, no. The, the guy said, no, I actually just heard about it. All right, said Socrates. So you really don't know if it's true or not. Now let's try the second test. The test of goodness is what you are about to tell me about my student, something good. And of course, the guy said, well, no, it's the opposite of that. So Socrates said, you want to tell me something bad about him, even though you're not certain it's true. Of course, the guy kind of shrugged a little bit embarrassed. Now, Socrates said, you may still pass through because there is a third test. The filter of usefulness is what you want to tell me about my student going to be useful to me. And of course, the guy said, no, not really. Well, Socrates said, if what you want to tell me is neither true nor good, nor even useful, why tell it to me at all? So, Socrates was trying to teach 400 years before Christ that we must not only do good, but, but we must think well of others too. So, at the end of the day, we all know that there's no giving up, right? We all have to work. There's no abandoning ship. There's no disappearing from our responsibilities. If we're all good good people that contribute to our family, our friends, everyone around us, our coworkers, we have to adhere to our responsibilities. And Emmanuel, the spirit guide to Chico C. Xavier, tells us that we need to work in order to evolve. Because without growth and change, we are stagnant. And in order to grow and change, we have to work. This is what he says. On every occasion that we feel compelled to desert from serving, alleging failures and imperfections, it is convenient to observe the logical lessons from nature, which finds in work its own path to evolution and improvement. If the seed gave up its germination because of its confinement in the cloister of clay, it would not produce the fruit that feeds the human being. After all, the attention it receives from the fruit grower is in direct proportion to how it produces. If the rose bush decided to prevent its own flowers from blooming, because of the thorns transfixed along its stems, it would not produce the roses that embellish the world so much. Again, it gathers only as much care from the gardener as it produces in flowers. If the spring denied the soil its benefits on the ground that it would have to run through mud and stones on the riverbed, if the metal decided to betray its own utility in supporting the boiling crucible, if the animal persisted indefinitely in its refusal to be tamed, alleging the extreme aggressiveness still persistence in its behavior. And it, on it goes, all of us, incarnate and discarnate spirits alike, 
in the evolution here on earth are at the moment far from the angelical condition, much in the same way that other elements in nature are still in infinitely distant from the human conditions. Indubitably, due to our reason, our ability to reason, we have a duty to improve ourselves on a constant basis, but it would not be licit for us to allege defects and in incipients in order to flee from collaborating in the construction of goodness for the benefit of all. Since we are observed and appraised towards the superior life by the extent we seize the opportunities to assist in our lives. Therefore, in our work, let us love the dispellent of all shadows that are still attached to us in the domains of the soul. Let us be convinced that in all districts of the universe, perfection is the final aim for all creatures in all things. Nevertheless, for the adequate execution of such perfection, work is an execrable process. Hence, whatever smooth or rocky path has been selected for you in your career, it is the road which leads you to your perfection by the most optimal route. While this concept may seem fantastical to many, it is the plan. You may shake your head in desperation or amusement at the twists and turns you have lived through thus far. But more importantly, it is for you to never give up and use each hurdle as a platform instead of an obstacle to advance your quest to become a pure spirit. So I want to thank everyone for uh, being with us tonight. And again, I'd like to, to anyone who wants to go further in studying spiritism, I'd like to... Uh, give you some tools to help one you can go to my blog at nwspiritism.com there are plenty of articles there there's links to my books on the right hand navigation site you can also go to the uh, site spiritismstudy.org you can use that to get an appointment with myself or other spiritists and we'll just talk to you i just had an email the other day and what i'll say is you know can i talk to you let's say it's six o'clock on tuesday or whatever and i'll say yes and Here's my uh, WhatsApp number, and here's my Skype, Skype name. Let's do a quick test to make sure we can connect, and then we'll talk. And it's, there's no obligation. There's no nothing. We'll just talk, and um, whatever path you want to go through, any help you need, I would be more than happy. I love talking about spiritualism to people. There's nothing more pleasurable than that. Also, if you would like to learn more about the spirit world, about the processes, the inner workings, my book, Heaven and Below, it's, it's a book one of three books, Heaven and Below. Then the second book is Spirits in the Spirit Universe. And the third book is How We Are Guided by Spirits. Gives you an insight into this process of the spirit world, not only in the lower levels of heaven, in the lower regions around the earth and the dark abyss, but also the higher levels. And this is information I have not seen anywhere else but in the books by the Reverend G. Val Owen. I've not seen this information in other books brought by Alan Kurdek or Yvonne Pierre or Chico Xavier. And this tells us a lot about the educational process of heaven, how we rise from one level to the next, how we go through different colleges in one level of heaven and then rise. It tells us so many things. It tells us different career paths. I've only known one, but they say there are many. There's many things I don't know, I'm not telling you it tells you everything, but at least it gives us a little bit more at the peak hole of what we can see. We here, frail humans on earth can see what it can in heaven. It tells us about how Jesus is active in the spirit world, how he is the governor of our planet. He is always there. He meets with people. He motivates people. He's there for congratulating people when they, when they rise up. It is just amazing to think what life is like in heaven and in, by reading these books this will give you a preview of how things work and hopefully what this will do is motivate you to study more and start changing your character because that's why we're here we're here to reform our character we're here to rip out the primitive emotions and replace them with good emotions so i want to thank everyone for being here tonight it's been wonderful and remember i will be on live streaming on spiritism in the spirit world around us facebook site on wednesday night at the same time i was here which is 7 p.m eastern all the other time zones i'll be on the spiritism spirit world around us on wednesdays and 
the Kardec Radio on Sundays, all at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Anyway, good night and God bless to everyone.